Welcome back, everyone. My name is Sam. And I'm Melissa. I grew up in the FLDS community. It is a polygamous group run by Warren Jeffs, and I moved out when I was 18 years old. I was raised LDS. Sam and I have been married for nine years and have two awesome kiddos. <laughs> yes, we do. We want to quickly thank all of our members of our channel and also our donors on DonorBox. We really do appreciate your love and support. Yes, today we have been watching Secrets of Polygamy, and I think this is episode five when it brought up the Kingstons once again. And as we started watching this, I think we were like 10 minutes in, and Sam and I looked at each other and I'm like, I'm texting Amanda Ray right now <laughs> because we have to hear more about this pure bloodline and the theology and why it's important and i just had so many questions so we want to thank amanda ray for coming and hanging out with us yes, thank you it's so weird that i happen to be in the area i'm like oh i'll just come over <laughs> yeah it was crazy yeah because we do not live near each other and so then when i text and you're like i am gonna be in your town I'm like perfect it was meant to be she was meant to be here to talk about this because Oh man, I have so many questions yeah. and there's so much of this that I feel like a lot of times there's a lot of theology that's similar between the LDS and these other groups. And mm -hmm. this is one of those things that feels so like off and crazy to me that, yeah. you know, isn't as similar. So I'm really excited to ask the questions. Yes. So thank you for being here with us, Amanda. Yeah, We're excited. You. I'm talking about bringing an expert on and all the <laughs> Kingston side of everything. Well, so I am Kingston. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> So I'm, I'm very intrigued as well, because as far as the FLDS goes, I think there's probably going to be a lot of similarities to oh, yeah. what you believed in this topic anyway, the bloodline stuff. Mm -hmm. But the bloodline wasn't really preached in the FLDS like it was in the Kingston. Right. So I'm excited to see what the differences and similarities are between the two groups there. Well, and that's also something that we, I think we've talked about this on your guys' channel before, where we would point us, the Kingston, would point our finger at you guys and be like, oh, the FLDS is weird for the dresses. But then I heard that you guys were pointing at us like, well, at least we don't marry our siblings. <laughs> <laughs> I literally thought you guys did until you guys oh, told me. I was right. like, wow. So we were the weirdest. <laughs> well, I mean, I guess depending on how you look at it, but there were definitely some things that the Kingstons did that in our eyes looked like, whoa, what in the, right. these crazy people, right? And That's insane. this is why they're not the true church. And this is why we are. There's always going to be that back and forth. But apparently you guys had this pure bloodline straight from Jesus Christ. So we're excited to uh, hear why yeah. you believe that. <laughs> Yeah, in the episode, it kind of started off with this idea because in the previous episode, it had talked about the Kingston, just in Kingston group in general, a lot of their beliefs, mm -hmm. definitely a lot of fear for the people that left. Like this was the episode where there were a lot of people that like didn't want their faces shown and it was like super secretive, wanted their voices distorted mm -hmm. out of fear. And then this episode, they straight up just started. They said, Ortel in 1940 had a revelation. That there was a holy bloodline and Jesus was a polygamist. Mm -hmm. So let's start off with that. <laughs> Are they talking about the 1940 meeting? I think so. Okay. They just said the second prophet, right? Wasn't it? Or tell yeah, was the second prophet. Mm -hmm. So Did you say that was your grandpa? Mm -hmm. My dad's dad. Yeah. Oh, okay. So my dad's dad is Ortel and my dad's mom was Ortel's 10th wife. Well, on her gravestone, it's the eighth wife, but technically the 10th because Ortel um, married by proxy. Oh. So he married wives that were supposed to be married to Brother Eldon, but Brother Eldon died of cancer at a young age. So he supposedly married these wives for Brother Eldon so they could be returned to him, but wow. he married them to have the children. I've heard the FLDS does that too. Yeah. Not so much. <laughs> no. So not that I know of specifically, the no. marrying by proxy, that doesn't ring a bell. I mean, it's possible. Okay. It's very possible. I've heard it was a term that like Brigham Young was coming up with. Yes. yes. I've heard, I've heard of that like in early pioneer stories, the idea that like there's certain sealings that need to happen or like Joseph Smith was sealed after he died oh. to like certain women, like they were still sealing women to him so yeah. that they could still go to the celestial kingdom. Mm -hmm. So I do know that that kind of thing happened, this idea of like, even if they weren't alive, you could still seal to them. Yeah. So I'm guessing that might've been where that came from. Right, I have to, I always have to preface and say, oh, my, my grandma's the 10th technically, but because on her gravestone, order people will be on here and be like, no, 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 on the gravestone, she's, it says 10-8, <laughs> meaning she's the eighth wife, but technically she's the 10th, but it's because they don't consider these other wives the wives, but they were having kids with them. So yeah, my, my grandpa was Ortel, which is the, uh, was the leader at the time. Were you saying there was a meeting that they had okay. that where he revealed the Holy bloodline and that Jesus was a polygamist? Yeah. So, so that was, I, I believe the 1940 meeting and they refer back to this 1940 meeting all the time in, in the order, because this is when like all these revelations came out. Mm. 
I don't remember that that was brought up that Jesus was a polygamist in the 1940 meeting, but I do remember as a child, it was just common knowledge that Jesus was a polygamist. And what did they tell you? Like, what was it just in a revelation? He was polygamist. Did they have like a theory of who his polygamist wives were or like, how deep did it go? Or did they just say he was a polygamist? So that's why we are. Yeah, well, I think that they have to have Christ be the supreme example, right? Mm. So, because there were people questioning, oh, wait, he, we, to get to the celestial kingdom, have to live polygamy. So they put two and two together, and they were like, well, if Jesus never even had married, because they all believe that you have to be married, right? Marriage mm -hmm. is a celestial thing. And so they said that the woman who he saved from getting stoned okay. was one of his wives. <laughs> They, oh. they flat out were saying, like, we know for sure that that's one of them, and he had multiple others. So I don't remember what the other ones were, but I know for sure they told me that the woman that was going to be stoned was his wife. Well, I'll, I'll tell you that the FLDS taught the same thing. Okay. And I think that it's very convenient when, if, you're, if your practice is polygamy, and that's kind of what your church is teaching, it's very convenient that Jesus did it as well, right? Right. I mean, and so, just so you know, the FLDS taught the same thing. That's... He had all of these different wives. But this is the, the alarming thing. Where does it say that? And they would say, and they probably said this to you guys too, they had to protect his family. So mm -hmm. they couldn't tell us. But then what? They talked about his mom. Nothing happened to his mom. Right. So yeah. why would they go after his wives? I feel like also like it would add a certain amount of validity to the idea of polygamy as well, because we have like a lot of people on our channel that will say, oh, you know, there's nothing in the Bible that says that we should practice polygamy. Yes, God allowed polygamy at certain times for certain reasons, but he never said that you had to, mm -hmm. you know, it was never declared. It was never something that had to be done. It just always was, okay, it's okay if you have these concubines or if you have yeah. these mistresses and stuff. So I think the idea, like, it's almost smart for the leaders to say, okay, it's not just the Old Testament because Jesus Christ came in and, you know, wiped away a lot of the yeah. Old Testament stuff. But if Jesus Christ himself did, then you can get away from that argument of all the biblical right. polygamy and whether or not those needed to be restored. Right. So we need some biblical scholars here to help <laughs> us understand because polygamy was talked about in the yes. Bible, oh, yeah. right? I mean, it's not like it's a foreign concept throughout the Bible. And so, but Jesus Christ himself you're right. There wasn't any statement in that I can think of in the New Testament that says Jesus Christ had multiple wives that I can think of. Honestly, I always thought that he was kind of anti-marriage because I remember reading a verse that said that marriage is just an earth, earthly thing. You, it won't, you won't be doing this in heaven. And I remember getting mad because I, I was taught my whole life I was going to have the soulmate, right? Yeah. And that's something people bring up as well in our comment section, just the idea of sealing or like all of Mormonism saying that there is marriage beyond death and that there's sealings. And they're like, no, Jesus Christ himself said that there was going to be no marriages in the next life because we're all meant to be like angels of him and to be a part of his family. Like we're part of his family and we're not meant to like have our own families beyond right. the veil. So, but that's why it's so convenient that they just keep coming out with new chapters, right? Joseph Smith came out with the new revelations. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Cause if there's that new revelation that no, okay, Christ was a polygamist himself. We need to follow his example. Mm -hmm. Then all of a sudden it just, yeah, becomes easier to go with. Right. Yeah. What did they say? Like, so this kind of led into Jesus was a polygamist. So that's another confirmation because at this point they're already living polygamy in 1940. Right. So yeah. it's a confirmation that we're doing what we're supposed to, mm -hmm. but then they said, but we are direct descendants of Jesus Christ. Yep. How did they do like, did any, has anybody done DNA? Have you done your DNA? Um, to see like where you're we didn't do it while well, i was in the order but when i left then i did do and i learned so much about the kingston last name is not even a real name like it's what? Yeah, you go far enough back and it goes to the name bull which is funny huh i was like this is so, <laughs> so we never really did it that, but it's like we didn't need to we have god on our side god's telling us right like you're you're kind of like critical thinking skills are like you know yeah, yeah. So I just remember being taught that it was taught in the, and I don't know if this is FLDS teaching or Mormon teaching, but Jesus said, we need to keep the bloodlines pure, meaning we cannot marry outside of the 12 tribes of Israel. That makes a little bit more sense in my Mormonism brain yeah. <laughs> than what the idea of like having to marry siblings, the 12 tribes of Israel, for those of you who aren't familiar with Mormon doctrine, um, when you get your patriarchal blessing, which is typically when you're a teenager, you're told what tribe of Israel you are from. And for a long time, 
it was believed that like, that's your actual lineage, not just like a spiritual lineage, but like an actual physical lineage. And the church has shied away from that, from what I understand, or what they say now is because people of color can't be from the 12 tribes of Israel. Right. right? And so then they are grafted in, or they are adopted by tribes for them to be uh, from one of the 12 tribes of Israel, because everybody is supposed to end up in those tribes. Yeah. So yeah. in that sense, the church got around it by saying, well, we're going to adopt people into it. But if you were to keep that pure, then that would be a whole different thing. However, yeah. the idea that Israelites are a bunch of white people yeah. <laughs> is also intriguing to me. Well, and that was something that would cause arguments all the time when I was in the group and I was like, these pictures of Jesus don't look white. And they would edit the pictures because I think people were asking too many questions. So they mm -hmm. would start to make his hair shorter and his skin lighter because they really wanted to believe just pushing this racist, you know, stigma. And then um, I think that they just kind of with each leadership, it got worse and worse to where they really did think that their bloodline was truly of God. And they would have talks about how Kingston is the king's stone. And we had revelation that we really are like the true people were believing it though. Mm. I remember women being like, like just wanting so bad to have their daughters be married to these Kingston men. And I was like, mm. <laughs> so did they say anything about where Jesus is from? and how he could just be some white dude based on where he was born and That's raised? I, I argued it, and they were always just like, they, I, they, I would get laughed at. Like, I was the crazy person for asking these questions. Mm -hmm. Like, how do you not know, Amanda? I'm like, how do you know? <laughs> <laughs> like, they, it's like they really act like they knew him, like they met him. But I, wow. I remember bringing up these same questions, like, well, isn't Jerusalem, isn't that like Middle Eastern? <laughs> I don't know any white Middle Easterns, but... Then there was also the argument, well, he was half God. Mm -hmm. And so he could have had blue eyes or whatever. I'm like, okay, whatever. Oh. You can't argue with crazy. <laughs> right. Well, and when you're raised in a bubble like that, it's, it's hard. I don't remember asking much of any questions when I was yeah. in the FLDS. Yeah. You know, I mean, I just believed what I was told. When you're raised in a place like that, you're not encouraged to think outside the box. Oh, no. And so as a young boy or a young girl growing up in it, it's just very, I don't know, I feel like it's pretty common to just say, okay, well, this is what my parents know to be true. It's, there's no question in their mind. Mm -hmm. And so it must be true. I mean, I can trust my parents, right? Right. They definitely teach that uh, faith can be built upon your parents' faith. Like oh. Your own standing. Did they teach that? 100%. Oh, yeah. yeah. Well, like that it's okay to rely on your parents' faith until you receive your own testimony. Okay. Like, so same type of thing. Like, it's okay if you don't know and to, you know, put your faith in your parents' testimony or the testimony of the people around you. Or there were times that I personally was taught, like, look at the state president, what a smart man, like, especially I'd say like worldly intelligence. And they would tell us to look at those people like president Nelson right now. He's the prophet currently of the LDS church and brain surgeon, like literally like one of the smartest men, as far as like earthly standards go. And so there was always that, look at that. Like if he, how would he be deceived by something that wasn't true when he's so smart? And so you could also put, point. right. Yeah. Like he's so much smarter than what I am or what I could be. And so therefore, like if this wall wasn't true, like, don't you think he would have figured it out? So my questions aren't really that valid because there's all these men in high authority positions that know better than me and are smarter than me. Right. So I can just wait until I figure it out. And like, once my heart is changed and I can get my own testimony, I can like stand on that. Mm -hmm. But until then, does it really matter if I don't? Because all these other people that are smarter than me have it figured out. Right. Was education talked about much in the Kingston, like as far as the, the necessity or the need to get a good education? I think in the earlier days, it was a bigger deal, but I, I this is just my opinion. I think that the, they saw that the more education the women got, the more they left. Mm -hmm. And so when I started to get around the age of wanting to go to college, I was, because I was asking too many questions, it was never an opportunity for me to ever go to college. Like it was a known thing. And then I got pulled out of public school because I was around outsiders and I was kind of like a sponge, you know, taking all this information in and I was asking too many questions. And so as a woman, they definitely want to keep you, 
your purpose is to not do anything other than what's going to support the church. The men are more pushed to go out and, you know, go for positions that will help the church, right? Yeah. It's still very controlled, you know? Right. So I just asked because that's one of the ways people get away with manipulating their followers is not allowing them to get a lot of education. Okay. And I, I mean, in my family, it was talked about, you know, it's important to get an education, but then the action throughout the church was homeschool is the only way to get any kind of education. So homeschool it is period. And then it wasn't really enforced that much. I mean, I was out on job sites working at a very young age and, you know, a young teenager. So, cause again, it's, it's really just what's gonna, what goes into your brain is what is going to help the church and God and anything else you can just discard. <laughs> right. Yeah. Speaking of like just general knowledge out there and people going and getting educations, um, they were saying in this episode that the Kingstons are actually like sending people out to get degrees in um, genetics and become geneticists oh, yeah. so that they can come back and help the fact that there's so many birth defects. So I guess first, let's ask a little bit about when you are in some, like if you're all marrying each other and keeping this bloodline pure, right. because you're all descendants of Jesus Christ, so you can only marry each other, right? Then what kind of birth defects were happening? And like, did you see birth defects happen? It's, it's so crazy to think about because I think that it was a scary thing once the leadership started to see these birth defects because they relied so much on God is directing these marriages. So then why would there be birth defects in the leader's children or these chosen kids? It also, because it's a double whammy, they taught that if bad things are happening, it's your own fault. <laughs> so what are you doing? So if, if I, I, this is just my perception of what happened. I think that they, they tried to cover it up because they did do a pretty good job covering it up because I only remember seeing, and you can only really see the physical ones, right? Yeah. There were definitely internal stuff going on with these kids. But I remember seeing as when I was a teacher, at, I think I was 15 and I was helping teach one of these classes in the private school. There was a child that had a missing ear and she was just born without an ear. And then there were, um, I, I was talking to other members about, there was this family that all of the children were albino oh. and I was like I don't know if that's a, de a birth defect or what but the because also I wasn't educated on it in the group mm. but I was hearing that like obviously if you have more of these recessive genes and then you're marrying together and together and together you're going to have the the negative things coming out yep. so there was also stories of I've talked about this on my channel actually I still don't know the full story of what happened with this but this woman was pregnant and she was the sibling to the leader she was pregnant for nine months and then um, had the baby, but she came to church like a couple weeks later with no baby, no funeral. No one talked about what happened. Oh, no. So mm -hmm. stuff like that happened. And we don't know if it was because, you know, if it was something that was explainable, why wouldn't they explain it? You know, because yeah. there were times where like, oh, there was complications, da, 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 da. but this one was just silence. No mm -hmm. one has any idea what happened to this child. Mm -hmm. And when you're not going to the hospital, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm then it's just like it never happened right there's no documentation so if that's the thing is like i i think there was just a lot of stuff that was hidden there was a few things that you saw right but like that it's like who knows <laughs> so do you think that it could have been a miscarriage at that point or she, she, told us. she could have told us right okay i think that it could have been birth defects or something what something was wrong and then they this is just my opinion mm -hmm. they just discarded it because they didn't want to have the issue. Well, and that is some rumors we've heard and that the show Secrets of Polygamy talks about is that they, they fear that there are, is actually murder basically happening yep. because they're trying to hide these, these, I guess, birth defects from right. the rest of their followers. And it sounds like, to your point, they did a pretty good job at keeping it from you because you didn't really see much of that. Right. Yeah, I think one of the women, I think it was Luann maybe, one of the women on the show, she had mentioned that the leaders had said, like, it doesn't matter how many children we, like, lose in the process of trying to find, like, the perfect human, right? That it didn't matter if they were discarded because they were trying to create this perfect 
perfect like child, race. perfect race, I guess. And they were kind of saying that Ortel worked on a farm and was trying to like breed the perfect cow, right? Yeah. And we have family friends that are breeders for cows as well. And like, it's very particular, right? Like trying yeah. to get this perfect cow that is perfect for this or a perfect cow for milk and that. But did they tell you like, what kind of perfection are they striving for? That's what I always wonder. Cause I remember in Sunday school, they brought up this story of, of the, the cow breeding and how if you breed the, the right bull with the right cow, you get the perfect calf. And they were trying to integrate that in, in why we need to be very selective with who we are marrying. And we have a, a, a supreme, you know, the bull and the cow, the whatever was going to create the right kids. And so I, I really think that Ortel just kind of, he just really hyper-focused on that because Ortel was the first one who really was living incest. His first wife was his niece. That was the first case of incest, but he could not have kids with her. They were dying or like they would, they would um, like, let's, she would have like a miscarriage at five, six months. And then there were, I think there were two full terms, but they still, still born. So they didn't understand. He was frustrated with this. So I heard a story. I don't know if they talked about this on Secrets of Polygamy, but I heard a story that he was so frustrated. And this is kind of morbid, but he wanted to do tests on this baby to understand what happened to this baby. Why can't I, why can't I get my wife pregnant, right? Mm -hmm. and, and actually have a baby survive. And then um, I don't know if he did test on the baby. There's, there's rumors, whatever. But I think this just festered in him. And he was like, I want to basically have kids with my niece he had three nieces they were all sisters that he was married to and i think only one of them actually could have kids i don't understand why maybe there was like certain genes that somehow they could have kids but i was hearing that they also each kid had their own issues right mm. so i think what happened is he was just like mad scientist trying to figure it out in like the most weirdest ways right well and that's and that's so uh, other than heartbreaking right for all of these children who don't have a choice right um but even aside from that that kind of was along with what they were saying like going and hiring or not hiring but like having people become geneticists mm -hmm. and i'm like most i feel like it's pretty common in christianity the idea that you're not supposed to play god mm -hmm. right when it comes to children whether you know in certain Christian groups, whether that means no birth control, whether that means no like artificial insemination, yeah. you know, like people have different degrees of what they believe is moral in like helping create babies to begin right. with, you know, like test tube babies, is that okay? Is that playing God? Right. And so the idea that they can be like this intense in like so many of the ways for religiously, and then at the same time be willing to like mess with the genetic mutation of children right. in order like kind of blows my mind that they could like get there that they can be on that kind of mad scientist level and mm -hmm. still consider themselves not only christian but literal descendants of right Christ. well it's also so contradicting because they told us ever since i could remember you like god will tell you who to marry that was gonna be my question yeah. is, is if they're teaching that god is is organizing you know the, these marriages and everything then why do they think, like, wouldn't that raise a lot of red flags if they have to manipulate the genes? Exactly. And that's why I think they hid it from a lot of us, because I didn't know that they were doing these blood tests till I was like, on my way out. Mm -hmm. I started to investigate, and I had friends that were, you know, the leader's kids, the leader's brother's kids, and we got into some conversations about blood tests. And I was like, oh, so you've been blood tested too. And you've been blood tested. Okay, what ages? And we were like kind of having our own little meeting. Like something's happening, you guys. Yeah. And so each, each girl that I talked to had a different story. Like one of Paul's daughters was like, oh, he just was blood testing us to see if we were sick. And I was like, hey, <laughs> when, when have we ever gone to the doctors? Or when have they ever cared if we were sick? <laughs> like, come on. Yeah. And she was like, oh my gosh, you're right. And we were putting the two and two together like, we're we're getting like blood tested for something else that's what they mentioned they mentioned that on the show they did mention the fact that now they started taking blood samples of everyone in hopes of being able to start having the arranged marriages actually be able to produce healthy children right because then they could hopefully match up proper blood types and kind of do the testing ahead of time but like you said 
that literally throws like goes right in the face of there being any type of revelation or that god's directing marriage if you have to have a blood test to make sure god's thrown out the window and that was my question once i started to find this stuff out i would ask my mom i'm like they're manipulating the system and then telling us that it's god because if it were god and there was a family that was like nope all of our marriages is going to be by god we are not going to do any of your, your blood tests and it was actually or tells brother's family. So mm-hmm. the leader who died, his brother's family, he was like, nope, we believe in direction, da, da, da. They were marrying siblings and they were having a lot of issues with the kids. Wow. But they did not want to get the blood test because they believed in the, the God, you know, the whole idea of God directing it. And if it, if it needs to be, then it will be. But right. he still had his daughters marry the brothers and his daughters are marrying sons and whatever. So it's like, which is worse? <laughs> yeah. I have a question about all this, the children and in that in the FLDS there was a place that we called the clinic that where all of the members of the FLDS church would go to give birth to their children mm-hmm. and so it was kind of kept within the community in the Kingston group you guys are I mean yeah you have your little sections of where you live and your businesses and all that but you're kind of just intertwined with everyone else up in northern Utah right yeah. What about where the women gave birth to children? Was that done at home? Did they go to hospitals for that kind of thing? No, it was you, all of my mom's births were at home. It was very like rare to hear of someone going to the doctors. It was, I think it was, a, there was like one or two times that I heard that because the wife was like going to die. Mm-hmm. And there were times sadly where they just let them die or the baby died or because there was one instance where the leader was on site and he didn't want the, you know, the, whatever ambulance to come while he's there because you're not a midwife what are you doing here why are you delivering you know what i mean Mm. so there were casualties there were there were instances where you know i wish we would have had a place where they could go you know have the babies but i think they're progressing now they do have a clinic but it's not necessarily for childbirth i honestly think that the clinic was another reason to be able to study like because there was a lot of men that are now like sterile they cannot get their wives pregnant now and so there's this huge issue with it. And it's and you look at the families, it's because, okay, his parents are half siblings and their parents are related. And so now it's like mother nature's way of just being like, okay, well, you're going to have to die off because you guys are doing some weird stuff. <laughs> but so now they're doing these weird tests of like, you know, what's wrong with them? Like, how do we, how do we do like IVF? There's a lot of women doing IVF now, mm-hmm. but yeah, they, they don't have a clinic necessarily just for, that's the sad thing, right? Like you guys had a more wholesome, like all the women that are having children come over here with them. It's like, how do we get this boy to marry his sister? <laughs> it's, like, it's, it's so it's, like, it's crazy. Yeah. And all of this done in the name of keeping the bloodline pure mm-hmm. all the way back to Jesus Christ. Right. When we were watching this episode, Melissa had a really good question of why do you think Jesus would care? Like, why? Why is it important to have this direct bloodline from Jesus? I mean, we're not talking about authority here or or priesthood, as the FLDS would say. We're talking about a direct bloodline from him. Why would that matter? Well, and sorry, just to kind of piggyback off of that, like in genealogy, the line does go down. Like, even if you married someone from the outside, right? Like if Jesus was your great, 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 great grandfather, and you marry anybody else, whatever, your child is still going to be a direct descendant of Jesus on the paternal side, right? Like that's how family trees work. You don't have to marry the other roots of the tree. Yeah. Be a tangled mess. You can just have an actual lineage going down. And even if that came to Jesus. So what did they say as to why they had to marry each other instead of just not carrying on Jesus's line directly I guess I almost feel like the way it was portrayed was like the Kingston bloodline was the pure bloodline and then and then people just got so obsessed with it that it was like anything that's not Kingston is not good and and it was like this they didn't tell me that hey you're gonna have to marry someone more Kingston than you but as I got older I started to same thing I started to look at all the girls and be like okay, so they all married someone that is either the same level of Kingston as them or more Kingston. Mm -hmm. It's like they're marrying up to be able to get into the celestial kingdom because of this Kingston bloodline they're all so obsessed with. That's the thing is like, yes, we, we believe we were that direct descendant of Christ, but I think that it's this whole idea of I don't know if it's all religions, but I swear everyone just wants to be on this like pedestal. Like I'm better than you. I'm better than you. So it's like, 
well, I'm 90% Christ, you know what I mean? And so yeah. marrying someone outside, not only is it like, oh, they're not Kingston blood, but it's like, then my kids will be less Kingston blood than me, mm. you know? Like, mm. it's such a weird idea that they get super, I think these cults, that's the problem, is they're so, like, hyper-focused on something that's not real. Mm. Like, even the numbering system, like, men will work their whole lives to get this number. It's just a number. You don't get anything. They're just like, okay, now you have the number 30. And now you got your ticket to heaven. It's just this idea in their brain that gives them this value. Well, it seems like a lot of these high demand groups or cults use something along those lines yep. to, to, to give people that hope or reason to stay. Right. Mm -hmm. the, the, the more extreme you get, the more reason you're giving your followers to stay because it's, it, it comes down to the more extreme it gets, it's going to be a lot worse for you if you leave. Yeah. or you're going to be so much more blessed if you stay. Yeah. And so they give you these reasons, like you said, like the numbers. It's like, how good would that feel to know you have your ticket straight to the celestial kingdom because yeah. you were given a number. Hooray for me now, right? Yeah, but all of it also, it's all the same thing. It's all this like, again, I'm better than you or, or reasons to feel like entitled or, oh, I'm Kingston. I was just born with this entitlement. And that's what I think FLDS did this the same way. We were born and lucky enough to be chosen to be mm, in this. Oh yes. And then you get this kind of almost like narcissist <laughs> yeah. where you're like, God loves me more than anyone. <laughs> oh, yeah. I was like, I think that happens in a lot of horizons. Yeah. Even in the mainstream, I want to say like the weird constantly told all of being the chosen generation, right? Like I know all of us probably got told that we're a chosen generation. <laughs> um, I remember there being, there was actually, when I was in seminary, there was a story that like our generation, my generation, when we go to heaven, there's going to be like silence for, you know, people are going to be in reverence over how we survived through the last times. Right. And then like a couple of years later, it came out and they were like, we got, um, news from higher people to say, like, we can't be telling stories if they're not doctrinal because there were stories like that coming out, that there was going to be reverence in the heavens for us dealing with like, the things that we're dealing with <laughs> because we are so chosen and so righteous to bring to pass the, you know, second coming of Jesus Christ. And thank goodness, I feel like a lot of that is stopping and I could kind of see the shift even when I was like in seminary. But when you feel like you're the chosen generation and that like the coming of Christ is all on your shoulders and you have to be righteous enough to be able to like withstand all the temptations because the world is the worst it's ever been. Mm -hmm. It's a lot of motivation to stay pure, to stay clean, to do all the things. Yeah. But how good that must make you feel, though, to, to know that you were this chosen person. Right. I felt great. Yeah, <laughs> so good. That, that's the weird thing. It's like, it's like they feed a little bit of this, like, narcissism. But then they're also, like, uh, to be able to keep that, though. Doesn't that feel good to feel like the chosen one? To be able to keep that. And then they, they, uh, they base a lot of fear. So oh, yeah. fear drives irrational. Because when I look back on all the things I even did in the cult, I'm like, why was I doing all that? <laughs> but it's because fear is so ingrained in you that you really are just doing all this stuff that, that, that doesn't make sense. It right. doesn't even matter. Like to get the number, right? It's like, if you were to have that number and come out here, it's like, that means nothing out here. <laughs> so just to be clear, only the man get the numbers, right? Yes. And this was also something I asked so many questions when I was there. Cause I was like this, the math ain't math and you guys, <laughs> but I asked this, I'm like, so I'm a woman why don't I get a number? And mm -hmm. then they have this whole the whole thing of like, well, when you are married to a man who is a number, which is also more motivation to, to be with a number man, uh, right? Mm -hmm. Only man. Um, then, so like my mom, she's the second of three wives. My dad's number is 36. So she would get 36.2, 362. That's her number. Oh. And I was like, okay. And this is also why, like, my everyone's like saying my grandma was no, she was the eighth wife because on her gravestone, she got eight dot or sorry, 8.10 or 8. Yeah. So <clears throat> they have this cemented on the gravestone, his number and then her number as the wife. That right? sounds so clerical. Like, I know, but like, I was like, <laughs> so uh, it just doesn't make any sense to me because uh, also like, what if they get divorced? What about the kids? What if you marry the wrong one? Are the kids just the wrong kids? And they're just like garbage kids. They just go straight to hell because you made the wrong choice in marrying. So I had all these questions that they seem to have answers for, but then there would sometimes be times where they would say, are you questioning God? Mm. And I'd be like, no, never. <laughs> I just want to know how he got this answer. <laughs> wow. But so did you ever receive any kind of number? No, because I didn't get married. Okay. And so the one I was supposed to marry 
his parents were half siblings and um, he did not have a number yet, but I left and then my friend ended up marrying him. And then she left later. She told me that he, he could not get anyone pregnant. So he was one of those people that if I would have married, I always tell the story, like if I would have got married, I would have married my first cousin. We would have had kids with 12 toes, da, 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 but we probably wouldn't have had kids because he could not even get anyone pregnant because he was so like inbred that Dang. it ruined his like fertility, steroid. And yeah. 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 Is it true they were saying in the show that like the goal of a Kingston woman is to have a baby every year? Oh, yeah. Yep. My mom, I remember her getting shamed because she took a break. There's two of my brothers that are like four, three or four years apart. And someone was like, wait, what? <laughs> um, was there a miscarriage? Was there like, there has to be an explanation, right? Mm -hmm. And even if there is miscarriages, I almost feel like people were, you know, like as a woman, that's your job. How, how are you having miscarriage? And it was like Ugh. frowned upon to be, to be a woman in the order. That's your only, you know, value. And how dare you not even be able to know how to do that? Yeah. I remember that kind of mentality in the FLDS as yeah. well. Just that women didn't seem happy or fulfilled if they weren't having children yep. frequently, because it was, it seemed like that was their, or they felt that it was their only purpose right. or their main purpose anyway, is yeah. to bring children into the world and raise them. And that was, yeah. So it was very frequent that these women were having children. That's the sad thing though, is like, so, so obviously they're motivating them to have all these kids because that's how you build the kingdom. But the women were so put down and if the women only knew that they were the reason why the church even exists, if they didn't have these women, like these men are on these pistols and like great men, blah, 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 blah. The women are the ones bringing the life to the church. But it's almost like they try to make sure that the women's value is down here and they don't realize how valuable they are because then they can manipulate them more and get more out of them. Mm. It's a really twisted thing because as, as a woman in the cult, I, my value was like, garbage <laughs> because to me it was like yeah i better i better be able to have as many kids as possible i better be able to live up to all of these standards that are so like unrealistic and then if you can't like and something as simple as oh i can't get pregnant you know well i saw men who had like 10 15 wives they just would forget about the wife that couldn't have kids like she was just not a part of the family anymore and it's mm -hmm. like what's your purpose you're just like a, a broken tool Mm, that's ridiculous. so sad i will say that's one plug for the lds church we're taught that guys can't get to heaven without us either so there you go one point one point <laughs> one point for the lds i did it. have an order man say that after i left and i was like that's interesting you guys are teaching it now i've never heard you guys say that but technically the men would have to be living polygamy to get to heaven but yeah. they really centered it around women need to find the righteous man yeah. Right. Oh man. Yeah, the women finding a righteous man is also in the mainstream. Oh yeah. The S church. Oh, yeah. There's still the, very much this precedent that you need to marry a worthy priesthood holder, mm. preferably know. a return missionary. Right. Oh, I remembered. Yeah. I remember right. hearing people. Is In and Out Burger owned by LDS people? They are not. They are just a very Christian company. You knew that I worked for In and Out, right? For nine years. No, I went to an In and Out, and they were Mormons, and what? they were talking about like, and I really like him, but. You know, he's not a return mish. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, wow, that's really like up there on the list. Oh, things. yeah. Yeah. And I think it comes from like two different things. Well, first of all, I love that you went to In-N-Out because In-N-Out has my heart. That's Worked for so them funny. for nine years till I had Lila, our oldest. And um, so, yeah, but so they're just a super Christian company, but not Mormon. But part of the reason why you're looking for a return missionary is so that you can find a man of the caliber, like, that was also worthy in his teenage years that was wanting to do everything the prophet said right okay. so when the prophet says every worthy young man should serve a mission mm -hmm. and it's saying that that's like an absolute requirement if you're worthy well now automatically return missionaries their worthiness is here if you didn't go on a mission it was almost assumed that you weren't worthy uh, so then you're a less than for not having served a mission Wow. Sadly, and a lot of pressure. so much pressure. And then, you know, it's changed a lot. I would say in the last like five to 10 years, but when I was dating, it was very much too, like if a guy came home early from a mission that was like tainted that you yep. came home for whatever, whatever the reason it's, was, right. You must've been like, disqualified. you must, you must've sinned and you didn't clear it up before you mm -hmm. left. And um, that was always like a big assumption, but there were all sorts of reasons. So it was this huge thing because then you had 
someone who is worthy in their teenage years, mm -hmm. went and served a full-time mi mission, yeah. serving God, doing what the prophet said, and then that's kind of your gauge of he's honoring his priesthood, and I want to marry someone who honors his priesthood so right. that we can be sealed in the temple and have our eternal family. Yeah. And yeah, and the men were taught, or the men are taught something similar too in the mainstream LDS church, I which I joined and served a mission as well. Yeah. Later That's why on. we're married because he served the mission. <laughs> he yeah. ranked up there. <laughs> yeah, we ranked real high. We were told things like, you know, if you, and I don't remember who this came from, but it was the idea was if you went home early from your mission, then you you might have a really hard time finding a, a spouse. Okay. Like life was going to be very difficult. Some families. Uh, not disown, but definitely, definitely look down on their children if they come home early. Wow. Like there's a lot of, lot of pressure to be a good, worthy missionary. It that feels like Mulan, dishonor on you, dishonor <laughs> on your cow. Like yeah. that was like a whole. That makes sense. And then it's also like, cause once you get out there, you're like, oh, this is so great. Then you get out there and you're like, Ugh. but if you, I mean, I don't know if you have those thoughts, but I feel like I would having to go that long without like being able to be with your family. Yeah. Well, yeah. So for me, it was a little different for a lot of reasons, as you can imagine. Well, the Kingston's are a little different, but also similar in the sense that when you leave, you're not really welcome back. Right. Oh, that's true. So you're like, what? Well, my family anyway. <laughs> so, so my my biological family, when I left, I wasn't allowed to really be with them. Mm -hmm. Also, because I was raised in the FLDS, where the rules are more strict than a missionary's rules anyway. Oh, yeah. I was I was on a par I was on a party bus the whole time yeah. on my mission. You know, I mean I, I had more freedom on my mission than growing up almost. He's like, okay, so I can't date. Not used to, I, that's not a big deal. Never did that. Okay, so I can't watch TV. Who cares? Never could do that anyway. So a lot of the mission They're like telling you the rules, no TV. What's a TV? What's a TV? Yeah. Doesn't even matter. I can't do this, can't do that. Okay, it's the same. I'm just going back to the way I was raised. Yeah. Basically. It's like nostalgic. Yeah. yeah. It was a little challenging because I felt so I left the FLDS church and then about nine or ish months later I joined the church and then had to wait for a year before I could serve a mission so I got a taste of freedom okay you know between after leaving the FLDS church and then serving a mission so I got this taste of being able to date being able to listen to the music that I chose our two lunch dates our, our two lunch dates right? <laughs> and, and so there I got this taste of freedom so going to the going on a mission I had a much less hard time than the other missionaries because right. they were raised differently. But at the same time, I did, I guess you could say, you know, when I was walking around Chile and, and seeing people out having fun, headed to the beach and things like that, there was the moments where I thought, man, you know, I did miss it a little bit. Yeah, because you can't go swimming on the, on the mission, right? That was my brother Esco's hardest. He was like, not being able to go swim in the Caribbean Ocean. Oh, it far. but it, it's because there's a weird, like, the devil's playground is in the water or something. So the, were you taught that in the Kingston? So in the mainstream LDS, that's what I was told as to why missionaries weren't allowed to be in the waters because Satan controlled the waters. Okay. It was like never official doctrine. It was just something that if anybody asked that question, that was like the go-to answer. Mm -hmm. But then Sam was taught in the FLDS that Satan controlled the water and the air. So you weren't supposed to fly either. Did they have what? either of those in the Kingston? No, but that's something that doesn't make sense. Cause it's like, you get baptized. So why are you getting baptized <laughs> in the water? You know, uh, stop asking good questions. Amanda. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> None of it added up. But so I think we did have the similar belief because there was a huge rule, no swimming on Sundays. Mm -hmm. I think that was a big thing. So I don't know if it can stem from that. I remember. So that was like with the LDS too, like a lot of people that would swim during the rest of the time. Cause we were allowed to swim. Like we could be in the water, but somehow like Satan was going to, only drown the missionaries because they were more <laughs> important than the rest of us, right? right. But then me. I'm a sinner. Yeah, I'm on his side. <laughs> exactly. So we could swim the whole rest of the time. But I remember that being something super confusing as a kid when people would be like, "But we don't swim on Sundays," and I was like, "Okay, so like Satan only has control in the waters like, of when you the full moon. on Sundays." <laughs> oh, yeah, when the full exactly. moon turns to red and the stars directly align, it's like witchcraft. That's what it sounds like. Yeah, it was it was really really confusing as a kid. So I think some families just took to the extreme because there are some families that choose that, some families that don't. It, but we were told, and I think this actually comes from a early leaders of the mainstream LDS church before all the splits off, the split offs even mm -hmm. happened, where it was taught that big bodies of water were controlled by Satan. 
Oh. So it was it was only the big bodies of water. So you're good in baptismal fonts. Yes, yeah. baptism, <laughs> baptismal font, you're fine, exactly. So things like that. But in, in, in the FLDS, we were allowed to go splash around in a stream or things. Mm -hmm. We just weren't allowed to go jump in a lake or jump in the ocean. Oh, okay. interesting. Yeah, I don't think that we had any of the that differentiation, I guess. Yeah. It was just like the Sundays, like the holy day is a Sunday or whatever. But yeah, there's the more I like look back on all of these beliefs, I'm like, every, I don't know how anyone believes this stuff, but it's that blind faith, mm -hmm. right? It's like mm -hmm. you what you're raised in. You don't know what you don't know. Yeah. Piggybacking off of the, your parents' faith. And then also the fear of questioning for, for me, it was like questioning God was the biggest sin. Did mm -hmm. they ever tell you that? Yes. Basically, if you're questioning the leader, which is talking for God, and that is you're, right. you're, you're questioning God himself. So right. in a way you're denying his truth. And so, yeah, that's a big, big scene. Yeah. They told us that, so there's the 10 commandments, whatever, but then there's the unforgivable sin. And one of those is questioning God. So when I would get, you know, my dad would say, well, are you questioning? We were taught not to question. Mm -hmm. Then there's like all this fear, like, no, 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 I'm not questioning. But it's like, then, then what can you ask? You know, what is yeah. the, the right amount of, you know, peeking over, you know? Yeah. Well, it's like, and how are we supposed to gain the knowledge that we're supposed to be on this earth? Like we were always taught, like you're, you're on this earth to gain the knowledge, right? And knowledge is the only thing we can take with us to the next right. life. And that's why this life's so important. And so it's like, why, when you try to gain more knowledge, but if you're not asking the questions that they have the answers to, or not asking the questions that they want to answer, mm -hmm. that knowledge equals bad. Right. But if you're asking the right questions with the specific answers that they already have waiting for you on a silver platter, then those questions are good because you need that knowledge to go into the next life. Right. So it's so, it's so like curated, but then it's, it's like a design where everyone's just copy paste, copy paste. No one's original. <laughs> Don't worry, sisters. All your answers will be answered on the other side. <laughs> That's what they say? <laughs> Things like that were very common, yes. Wow. They have to say sisters because the girls are like, we are getting the wrong, like, you guys are winning as the men and we're losing. <laughs> yeah. Just in my, where I came from, it was just keep sweet. Yep. Keep your questions to yourself. God has all the answers. <laughs> you know, you don't need to be questioning. You don't need to be asking. Just keep sweet and obey. Yeah. Yep. Wow. So. Well, thank you so much for coming, hanging out with us, answering all these questions about the bloodline. Like, oh my word. Like I said, as soon as this one started, I was like, no, I need more than what this episode, I need Amanda. <laughs> yeah, this is fun. I also, I, well, I'm going to ask you guys this on my channel as well, but I have a question that I want to dive deeper on, on our interview. Yeah. Do you feel like because of the whole no questioning thing, it made it harder for you to as an adult even have a personality or even know who you are? <laughs> uh, it's hard to know what things are coming from my own brain and what I've been taught my whole life. I think separating out how do I truly feel and what do I believe on every topic. Like you almost don't realize how much it goes into what I believe politically, what I believe socially, what I believe for myself just as a person. All of those type of things, I feel like when you decide that you're not going to care what the organization says and you have to try to decide, but like, where can you separate like all of your core beliefs come from the way you were raised. Right? right. And so to separate who you are as a person and that organization or the, that belief system is really tough. And yeah. so for me, that's where I feel like the hardest when I ask questions and, and I'll be like, wait a minute, am I, is this answer coming from me in my core or is this coming, is this an answer from the way I was raised. Yep. And trying to separate those is so hard. Oh, I know. You feel some way? We've talked about this a lot. I often wonder who I would have been, what I would have done if I wasn't raised in the way that I was raised. Yep. I mean, because I was a very active, athletic person. At least mm -hmm. I thought I was. It probably was awful at everything, but I thought I was really good at things. Mm -hmm. And and I, I really think that I would have loved getting into sports. I would have loved getting some type of education early on and, and tried to do a little bit more with my life. But you know, I, I always say I had a good childhood. Yeah. And I don't I don't disagree with that. I do feel like I had a good childhood in the sense that I had parents that were trying the very best. Right. to raise good children based on the religion they belong to. Right. But I feel like if me and my family, well, 
if me and my family lived on the outside, I would have had a lot less brothers and sisters. So that's, <laughs> that's another thing too, is you can't really go back and change. Like I love my half siblings, right? right? Like I wouldn't not want them. Mm -hmm. So it's very tough to say, I wish things were different because that would have also taken a lot away from me. Exactly. I've, I've had the same thought process of like, what? Cause I got adopted into an outside family. And I got to see how they got to have all these skills at a young age and like, they got to explore them, you know? For me, I was like, same thing. I was like, I, I showed interest in these things, but my parents, they, those were not of value to the church. So those were brushed under the rug. And so I had those thoughts of like, who would I be if I had parents that actually cared about all of those things, right? The, those things would have been important to them or they would be excited about them. Where would I be? But then it's the same thing. Like, I feel like there's so much about my personality that comes out because I had 30 siblings. I grew up with so social. So I feel like that, in a sense, helps me on the outside to be more social. Mm -hmm. Whereas I've met people who have been only child and I'm like, sometimes I envy that, but then I'm also like, I don't think I would ever, I could not be the person I am now if right. I didn't have my 30 bajillion siblings. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yeah, a lot of people will also say when I'm talking to them and they are talking and asking me about the way I was raised. And some people from the outside are jealous that I had this life of outdoors so much right. and all of these no siblings computers. and, and yeah, social and media friends that just hang out with and have a wholesome right. upbringing in that sense. Mm -hmm. Of course, other things came along with it. But once again, I was one of the lucky ones that had a loving family, didn't deal with physical abuse things like that, where I know a lot of other families did. Right. So once again, I do realize that I am not to call myself a unicorn, but I am the exception to some of the rules that happened within other families. Right. Wow. Yeah. That's good. That's so interesting. And so you, so the thoughts of personalities is a big thing then. Yeah. <laughs> and for sure. Still, yeah. And maybe everyone, and maybe, I don't know if you guys want to comment because I'm curious if like people who have not been raised in religion still have that type of an idea of like, Oh, is this something that I do just because my mom taught me? That's <laughs> as you say, there's certain parts of just like, especially now that we have kids, there are definitely things that your kids are automatically going to pick up from their environment, whether right. your environment is religious, whether it is not religious, that can yeah. have an impact. If you have no religion in a very religious Western world, mm -hmm. right? Where there's so much Christianity around. And then if somebody raises their kid agnostic or atheist in a very Christian society, like there's, I've seen this with friends and family and where there's so many different aspects to it that no matter what, you can't help but be influenced right. by your parents. You can't help but be influenced by your surroundings. Right. You can't help but be influenced by society as a whole that you have to live in, yeah. right? Whether or not you're born here or whether you're born in the Middle East, those are going to have different societal norms, different. Right. There's so many things like that, that it's almost impossible to get rid of the nurture aspect of like being raised, you know, right. the nature, you know, people are nature predisposed to things, mm -hmm. but then that nurture aspect is so strong, whether you try to let it be or not, like yep. if you try too hard either way, you're still going to influence. So that's so true. That's, that's my, like in psychology, that was the most mind boggling it's like nature versus nurture how much of us is genetics how much of it is our environment how much is actually our choice <laughs> and how much is our personality just our trauma just yeah. coming out <laughs> yeah. yeah but who knows maybe maybe I mean, things could have been worse too that's right? true i mean it could always be worse or right? better you just so gotta be happy with what it's got. tough i mean i think that's the key takeaway is everybody's put in different circumstances, situations, family, environment, that we don't really have any control over that one thing, but we do have control over what we want to become, what we do now. And that's something I think is a good message for those that are in these high demand groups that are possibly dealing with some abuse and things like that, that you do have a choice, especially if you're a person that has children and your children are dealing with abuse. Yeah. I know it's so, so hard, but there have been a lot of strong women and even strong fathers that have stood up and said, no, I'm not letting yeah. my children deal with this. And that's all. And I feel like even, even if you have a good childhood, you know, no matter what your childhood is like, that's kind of giving to that next generation. Hey, I want to pass on the best parts of my childhood yep. and I want to leave out the things that weren't good because yep. every childhood's going to have both. Even the best childhood is still going to have stuff where they're going to say, you know, what? I want to leave that part out in passing that on to my kid and do the best that I can. Yep. And if you can 
continue to have every generation be a little bit better. That's ultimately like the goal, right? Yeah. Um, yeah well i guess we'll wrap it up we are gonna do an interview on amanda ray's channel yes. as well so if you have not checked out her channel before go see amanda ray's channel on youtube thank you so much for being here and we'll continue to react to more of the secrets of polygamy i don't know if they're going to continue kingston if they're going to go back to flds now i'm just curious where they're going to go next so it's all a mystery yeah. Secrets of polygamy. It's a big secret. So, secrets. but but stay tuned. We look forward to see what's coming next, and we will talk to you all soon. Thank you, Amanda, for being yes, here with you. us. Yes, thanks. Bye. See you later.